butchered your 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 newly last name, which is amazing. Love you, Sean. Um, <laughs> I I started this podcast, uh, and the reason why I asked you to come on is because um, recently there was a murder that happened in Georgia, and um, I don't know. It just I've I've cared about this. I've cared about racial justice and racial reconciliation for so long. Mm -hmm. And you know that. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I just, I felt like the Lord had closed my mouth for like the last four years. I mean, Mm -hmm. in private conversations, totally, but outwardly like on Facebook and stuff like that, he just kind of was like, no. And I just kind of felt like I wanted to grow in like this new understanding of like, totally walking with god instead of just like parts of my life are with god yeah and because i believed in jesus but i really believed in justice you know and i was like if it's not justice it's not jesus you know and um and so you know how many know that like when you walk with god it's more like um jesus what do you say and then i comply you know (laughs) instead of like this is what i'm thinking and then jesus you know, amen. So, um, I just, uh, uh, wanted to kind of premise this first by saying Renee and I became friends probably like what, four years ago. Think One of my so. earliest friends. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think me and Renee met when we did outreach for the first time at Hillsong. Mm-hmm. And, um, little did I know after that outreach, cause you know, it's your boy. Um, she li- immediately told my friend Monique, who I hope will be on the show someday, and Mike, um, to make me a leader. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but I just loved her heart. She was so cool. I mean, it was it was so new to me. I had all these preconceived ideas about that church, but God was using me, moving in my heart and and using me there, and it was so fresh. And when we went went out and we saw my friend who's probably still out there, unfortunately. But, um, you know, we just showed compassion and, and, and it was amazing. And then that started our friendship. And then Renee and I would um, hang out. You know, we would talk. Going forward, we ended up talking like at least once a week in the summers. And eventually we kind of all came together and like started this, this organization called the Men of Honor Foundation to um, empower men in um, their godly masculinity, addressing toxic masculinity. And, and, and it's a multiracial group. Like it's just organically that way. But I think it's very dynamic in the sense that it has a strong multicultural expression versus other men's groups that I've been in mm. that, that tend to kind of like have a hegemonic, not hegemonic, that's probably too, authoritarian of a word but like um homogenous mm. you know mm-hmm. and 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 so men of honor which we have an event coming up on wednesday we're gonna plug it later but um i just uh wanted to premise that by just saying that like we've been walking out this walk for a while as friends and then she recently got married and and i got to be a part of that and yeah. climb on her ha- mom's roof and, <laughs> and and just turn that house into a an event hall yeah <laughs> and uh and so just saying that um renée's amazing and just uh maybe just say a little bit about yourself and then i'll i'll start asking questions and stuff and we'll see where it goes okay cool so a little bio i was born Two months premature in Chicago, Illinois, and lived in Des Moines, Iowa for six years, and then we moved to North Carolina, where I got married recently. Um, Thanks to JP, couldn't have happened without him. Um, (laughs) Yeah, so I grew up, you know, Christian, Bible Belt in the South, Um, you know, growing up in a Christian home. And especially one that is in the deep South, it you know, Christianity is normal. It's a part of nearly everyone's life in one way or another. Um, mm. After I graduated from high school, I went to school in Philly where I pursued a degree in architecture. And I was a part of like campus ministry there. Um, after I graduated, though, I was really like disappointed in God and 
where I thought I would be in my life by then. So I just walked away from my faith and Mm. spent two years doing whatever I wanted, Um, Mm. whenever, with whoever, until I came to the end of myself and ended up going to church at Hillsong. (laughs) And then, yeah, like three (laughs) years later, met JP. So it's definitely been a journey and, church has been a part of it um yeah and as jp said i got married i met my husband in church (laughs) everything's Mm. just happening there (laughs) um, which has been cool yeah yeah made eight months amen wow it's almost been a year that's right it's starting to get hot again and it was hot at your wedding it's blazing it's blazing wow i'm sorry but um so a little more, right? So your husband is from Nigeria, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hence the last, last name. My right. husband is Nigerian. Right. And he's been here for about three years. Awesome. So. Awesome. Yeah, he's an amazing guy. And yeah. and you yourself are an African American woman. Yes, I am. My <laughs> I'm actually technically I'm Guyanese American. Both of my parents are okay. from Guyana, South America. I'm first gen. What do you, so, how do you feel about, um, this is just coming out out of nowhere, but yeah. how do you feel about like when people say African-American or people of color and then, or now you just said Guyanese American. Mm-hmm. So, so it's like, is it more like if we know where we our origins are, we should identify those versus like more general terms that kind of are supposed to like, I don't know, honor like black folks better. Or yeah. Like, what do you I think? I don't think I have a strong opinion for everyone. I think for me, it's just depends on the context of the conversation, right? Mm. And the point. Like, if I need to make a point of it, I'll bring it up. Um, mm. I don't. I don't mind either way, mm-hmm. um, generally. But if it, uh, there, but there is distinction, right? I think, sort of diving into the topic a little bit. One of the things with that I've noticed about my childhood and my upbringing, even though I was in the South, you know, even though, you know, all of the things came up growing up in the South and in regards to race, the way my parents raised me is very different in very subtle ways from um, the, the Black narrative that generally mm. tells the story of what it means to be black in America. I yeah. think that the way and what's, racism, and what's that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah the way sorry, race, go ahead. No problem. The way racism is really set up, it's systematic. Um, mm. And it's different everywhere you go. So Guyana was definitely, you know, populated by slaves from Africa as well. But slavery in South America was very different from slavery in America. And it also wasn't institutionalized into laws the way that it that it is here. Mm. So I think even though we've moved so many hundreds of years beyond slavery, since a lot of our rules, regulations, laws are governed by these racist principles, then we still are dealing with the generational effects. Um, we're dealing with the generational effects and we're dealing with just the ongoing effects of things that are still current, right? Mm, yeah. Um, so I think experientially, like this idea of coming from generations of, you know, past slaves in America and like what that does to generations forward in terms of like an oppressive mindset, um, clear distinctions between black and white and viewing yourself through a white lens regardless if it's intentional or not because that's the way American society is set up you know history Mm -hmm. everything Mm -hmm. is told through the white experience Um, Mm. and I like that you said that because um, I often would say to people when I was early on understanding race in America as a white man um, I often really, really, uh, I just felt like I identified with Frederick Douglass when he said, let those who felt the whip 
be be the voice of the movement, not those who carried it, you know? Mm-hmm. And because um, he was speaking to William Lloyd Garrison, who was a Quaker, who was an abolitionist, who, you know, wanted to, you know what I mean, like help Frederick Douglass, but also end slavery. And it was awesome. But where he was, where the problem lied, and this is what I see a lot in like, um, you know, otherwise, you know, cool, like white allies or like anti-racist white people mm-hmm. is that, um, is that they, it's like they, it's like they want to end racism, but they want to be in control. Like they want to be in control of the narrative or something. Right. And it's like, it's like, no, 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 no. no. Like we have to like come alongside and then let, like, let those who are in need or like fighting for something, like help them, like help you or whatever, help Frederick Douglass by letting him tell us what we, what he needs. Right. Exactly. And then getting out of the way and letting him do it and making sure he's got these resources and supplies needed to get the goal accomplished. And that took me years to figure out. But once I did, I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> dude, racism is insidious. It's sick. Yeah. It's it's deep. It's like I'm born into right. it. It's like it's like it's like original sin. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, it's like we're born in iniquity. We're born in racism, <laughs> like a system of racism. Yeah. So, so like I, I um, appreciate that you that you said that, and then um, I also also when I thought about it too, I was like, whoa! Like Renee is my friend. You know, she's a woman of color. She's Guyanese American, but she's also a woman. Yeah. So like, you're the first first you're the first woman on the show oh, too. Cool. So, yeah, yeah, and um, and I think it only makes sense because we used to talk long you know and you would you would remind me about jesus and i would be like ah the system is crazy you know and you'd be like but jesus you know mm-hmm. and um and uh i i wanted i wondered what it was what was it like um because i think like hearing people's stories and hearing what life was like growing up you know being you know, uh, uh, a woman of color or, or, or any person of color, right. It's going to be interesting to someone who maybe didn't have to have that gaze, you know, the white gaze. Um, what, uh, how was it like in college and things of that nature? Did, did you experience like, like racial inequalities or injustices or anything like that? Yeah. Like we hear with the dominant justice narratives. Mm-hmm. I, I think, to wrap up my last point, it'll help me answer this question. Be- okay. Because my home, like my ho- home life wasn't dominated by that, like, white lens. Mm. There's a lot of things that I was saved from because of the mindset that I had, that I got from my parents. Because they weren't affected by slavery in America in the same way that other black families are you know what I'm saying like my grandparents weren't slaves here um Mm. so that generational oppression didn't make it to my house so there's a lot of things that were just not for me because I was Mm. told growing up from a kid I was never taught to look at color in the way that there was something wrong with my skin because it was brown you know one of the stories that my mom or it is brown sorry (laughs) one of the stories that my mom (laughs) tells about me in uh, kindergarten like I was drawing a picture of myself and I was using you know and I asked my teacher for a crayon and she gave me a black crayon and I told her Mm. my skin isn't black it's brown I don't need that crayon like from little you know what I'm saying whoa Wow. So, and that story is one of racism and oppression in America. It's subtle. It starts out subtle. Right. But because of the house that I grew up in, I, you know, I, from five was like, no, I need the brown one. That, that is, that's mm. what's mine. That's what belongs to me. Um, but um, yeah, so getting into more of a college, I, I did go to a predominantly white college. I grew up living in predominantly white neighborhoods as well. Um, my parents are 
pretty successful, like upper middle class. So, um, again, not being from here, the they didn't start out with the same tr- struggles and troubles as a lot of Black Americans have to face, you know? Um, mm. Yeah. And then for me in college, that same attitude as I, me, Renee, as an individual, I'm not going to accept, you know, things that aren't for me carried over, right? So being the only, was I the only, well, one of three Black women, um, and maybe there were like five Black people in my school of architecture, my graduating class. Um, wow really yeah wow man um you know you you i mean that makes sense that it's like yeah i can count on one hand like all the black folks i saw growing up right you you meet people like everyone's coming from plenty of different backgrounds and people are trying to be nice and be open there in college but you also hear and see you know the racism and it I did not Mm. have to experience or endure things that were like blatant and cruel and mean and I'm super grateful to God for that and then the opportunities that I had you know run-ins with was just ignorance people just not thinking and needing a friendly reminder that what they have done or said is unacceptable um so I really, sometimes I really valued like being the token black person around, you know, you get the conversations about hair and about all of the black cultural things that people feel like they can't ask just anyone or they're dying to know. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the times I wasn't offended by that. It's more of like, you know, you need this education because <laughs> I can see that I can see that you'd be like you know what I'm, I'm gonna going help to you. help you and please don't ask anybody else this question because you might get slapped in the face but these are very yeah. personal matters <laughs> I want yeah. to live yeah and that's very interesting because a lot of people um they they speak about that in a different way like they're like man I don't want to have to talk to you about that you yeah. know and I, I always thought that was really unique about you is that what others might, and I think it's like you said, it's, it's because perhaps it's because of, 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 of not having to go through different struggles that other people have. Yeah. But, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's cool because you need, we have to have grace. So we need grace on both sides. So right. it's like, you know what I mean? Like if, if, if Becky or whatever doesn't know, like, you know, it's like, you got to help her out, right? you know, and, and, and vice versa, you know what I mean? And, and there is a compromise that has to be made, but then it's like, when we get familiar like that, like, don't, you know what I mean? Don't tread, you know what I mean? Like, don't tread on me, you know, and use that against me when, you know, you're upset or something, you know, because it's just disrespectful and, in general. You, you shouldn't do that to people regardless of, their skin color you know what I'm saying like this just doesn't make human sense (laughs) yeah it's just not good for humanity to do that yeah it's just it's just it's like it's like a lot of times like as I'm thinking about I'm like god do you really want me to do this because when I'm when I'm pursuing this work I'm thinking to myself god it's like the more I do this the more common sense this is right (laughs) but then but then it's like in order to get to it being common sense, I had to go through that part of me that was like, wow, like I was raised to believe Mm -hmm. this awful, awful lie that was evil. And, and, and like to my parents and stuff's credit, they love me. And so they've like adapted to my passions, Mm -hmm. you know, because they see my walk with God and they're like, wait, and I'm like, yo, ma, if you're going to vote this way, or if you're going to do this, then like read this right. book. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, uh, um, you know, whatever. Sorry. <laughs> I just, uh, call came in and it distracted me, but, um, 
Um, yeah, so I, I appreciate you saying that. And then, uh, whoo, wow. Um, yeah, I think that's been interesting. I think like if you're, you know, for those of you who are listening, it's important to understand that not everyone had the same experiences. Mm -hmm. And I know that seems like common sense too, but honestly, it's truth. It's like not everyone has had the same experiences. And I think sometimes people get grouped into something or when it comes to media or music, pop culture, they get grouped into something because it's harder to have one-on-one conversations to get to know people and like Mm -hmm. realize we're all different. We're all different and beautiful and have something to offer. Even people that were like not really stoked about, you know, there's something about them that's probably beautiful. You know, there's got to be, you know, because God made us. But um, yeah, I just uh, um, thought that was cool. What about like growing up in like North Carolina and stuff? Like was what was that like? You know, because when I was there for your wedding, I was like, this is pretty chill town you know like i've been in areas where like i was like yo it's like it's dangerous to be white here it's dangerous for anyone (laughs) you know what i mean (laughs) right and like like in rural georgia or something you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) so yeah i was wondering what what was that like you know growing up in north carolina and stuff um i think growing up in north carolina you know your childhood you're pretty oblivious or a lot of the things you approach through a child's eyes like you're naive to a lot of things but looking back um it's just like some adults were just very racist Mm. and um in in very like blatant ways and and just the effects of the the education system in general and Mm. having friends you know get caught up in petty things like little fights or whatever and get expelled for an entire year there's this one guy who was my like we were sort of best friends but not really Mm -hmm. and we sort of despised each other but we loved each other you know what I mean we're a little bit like arch and nemesis or something but um because I was the goody two shoes and he was the class clown, but we were in all the same classes because he was super smart. He was just very goofy. And, <laughs> you know, he ended up getting caught up in whatever and getting expelled from school. Um, so this guy now who was on his way to do great things, be great in society's eyes was punished for something as a kid that cost him his, you know, education. And really your education is what you use to get ahead. A lot of the times it's like, you know, something you're indoctrinated in for most of your life. So it's a step up and he could have gone anywhere, done anything. And like this one mistake, should not have cost him his entire education, especially someone as intelligent and gifted as he already was. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's sort Mm. of if someone's already doing a bad job, you're like, oh, they weren't going to do anything anyways, you excuse it, which you shouldn't, but people do. But this particular person wasn't like that. Um, And people just treated him differently after that incident. And it was just like, you guys are adults. You know, you yeah. know what this means. Why would yeah. you, why wouldn't you help him? Teachers. Right, like intervene. Yeah. Teachers, yeah. where's your grace? It's like this, this person is too young to understand the magnitude of his decision. And he yeah. shouldn't have to suffer for the rest of his life because of things that you do as a teenager. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So. I saw that I saw that in my um in my high school growing up in Schenectady. Um it's funny because there's parts of Schenectady it's just so beautiful, really. It's pretty. And then there's like this other side of it that is just like hopeless. Like there's no hope, you mm-hmm. know? And um and still to this day when I catch it when I check, when I catch up with my little brother, um he's my like half brother 
He's like from my dad's second marriage. Mm-hmm. And um and so he's like half Puerto Rican and half white. And when he turned nineteen, he started reaching out to me and he was like, Yo, like like man, I'm Puerto Rican. And I was like, Yeah, and he's like, Bro, like my whole life I kind of thought I was like white. Yeah. You know? And now I'm like very aware of it and like people are responding to me differently and everything. And so we talked about that and I was like, I know I just I was like, hey, man, like, I was waiting for this conversation, bro. <laughs> I was like, just bring it to these white people at Schenectady. Right. And then, um, and so, um, you know, we, we had this, like, real get, real getting to know each other. And I told him, you know, encouraged him and to have pro- his. Mm-hmm. And he And he shared with me just not too long ago that, um i basically still to this day like everyone on a certain side of schenectady they're all like either on drugs or gone to jail or something you know Mm -hmm. and it's like it doesn't discriminate it's not just black it's not just brown it's not just spanish it's white folks it's it's everyone because um you know class don't lie you know (laughs) like it's like if you poor you poor and if you don't and i and i like what you said about education because if access to education is like an equalizer. Like if you've seen the movie with Denzel Washington, where he's the equalizer (laughs) for people, um, education's like an equalizer. It's like, and I'm just saying this because I, I, in a way I think like sometimes my my narrative is a unique one for Mm -hmm. a white guy, you know, but, um, but like before I had access to education and got my GED and then eventually college, I really thought anything like I had saw or like, like my worldview was like not large. Like it was my town basically or whatever mm-hmm. environment I was in. I didn't, I didn't like reading. I had a poor reading level. I was like fifth grade reading level, all these things. But when I found a book that I really enjoyed, The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton, I saw that there's, there was like, something I could identify with. There was the greasers and the, and the, and the socials and the socials were like preppy kids and the greasers were like, I, I would say like punk rockers. And I identified with that. And because of that, I was like, if you're passionate or like interested in the subject matter, like you could read, like I could read. And when I started reading, I started to learn a lot more about how to kind of defend myself and, and that intelligence is attractive, like all Mm -hmm. these things that are like kind of psychological and emotional. But then I saw the power they have Mm -hmm. in society. And then, but I didn't want to do it the way I was told to do it. I'm totally not that guy, but I loved education. So I pursued what I was passionate about. And I feel like education, just like with W.B. Du Bois in the souls of black folk, it's like without that education, without being the first African American mm-hmm. to go to Harvard, you know, bi, he was like biracial, yeah, I think, um, and and you know he was in Harvard, and for him his argument, <laughs> this came out of nowhere, but his argument was like Booker T. Washington is like basically what trade schools became, and like he is like what can happen if we access power, mm-hmm. you know, like not. I mean, we, I'm putting myself in there, but like, you know, if black folks or like anyone not white can access power, um, you know, in souls of black folks, he was just like, we can, we can change the narrative. Like we can, you know, we, we invent things. We're, we're, we're a part Mm -hmm. of this great society, you know, we're American and we're black, you know? And it's like, um, I just I just want to encourage that because a lot of times when these riots happened in Ferguson and other places, you know, it, it's because there's not an investment in the local education system to empower kids to see another option, you know, or to like grow, grow up, build a business and invest in their own community or anything, you know, it's just like. Yeah, what do it's you a do, tough you know? one. And uh, Sharon and I were talking about this yesterday. I I think you're you're right in that there, you know, education can take you very far. But I think also with the black experience mm. is that education and whether you have access to it isn't as easy as 
um, showing up to school or not, right? Like if you're going to be taught something, you have to be in a position to learn. And a lot of the times students, kids, teenagers are coming from households that are traumatic. And no matter how Mm. good the education might be, the care that is needed goes beyond an academic setting. You know, if I'm worried about my safety, if I'm worried about whether or not I'm going to eat, if I'm worried about if I'm going to, like, get arrested or shot or beat up, then I don't care about what's being taught. You know, you have to be very secure in order to even benefit from any type of education, despite you know, schools in minority wow. neighborhoods not being well resourced. Like that's a separate issue. But or if I could yeah. even get to school, is someone gonna take me? Do I have to walk? Or it's a really or, the inequity and injustice is is pretty big. It's complex. And Yeah, every little bit to address it or to try to change it helps. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I see that. I see that in my own my my own life too. It's like once I feel like this is something that is kind of powerful about having a relationship with God is that the inspiration you receive from having a relationship with God and that peace that you feel like if you're not a believer, this won't make sense. But like, if you're a believer, um, like there's this peace that comes, even though there's all this turmoil around you and the system's unjust and all these things, but that peace can actually enable you in a sense to equip you in ways that maybe your parents didn't or like other socialization didn't. And then, and then you can pursue something because you're reading in the Bible to like live an excellent life or like, you know what I mean? I could do all things through Christ. And then you kind of get along people in church and they can kind of foster you and kind of be like a father or a, a mother to you. I feel like this is a good place to transition into, you know, like when was it when you started to feel called as a woman to speak into men yeah because you are so gifted at this and i feel like we need to just remove you know what i mean like hey let everybody know yeah. The yeah you know what i mean um well i guess it two years ago maybe almost three i can't even remember i need to look back in my journal but um i think like once i realized that you and i had lunch and i was like listen to this um But, you know, looking back at my life, I was telling you about my former classmate in high school, junior high, who we were like enemies, but not really like he was one. He was one of the first people that I felt like, man, you know, I really have a friendship with this person. Um, And it's we had moments where like I could speak to him, you know what I mean? And like encourage him. And tell him, like, not to give up, to Mm. keep moving forward. And even into our adulthood, like, we still keep in contact, you know, sporadically through social media. And it's that same type of relationship. But there were boys at that time, but men in my life who I had that type of relationship with. Like, we weren't necessarily BFFs out in public, but because the nature of you know, who I was and who they were, I could speak into their lives or encourage them or I was their tutor. I would help them with X, Y, and Z. And there were just times in my life that I noticed that, oh, when I speak to these people, they listen. You know what I mean? Like, this is my audience and this is Mm -hmm. where, you know, I feel effective. And not even that oh, I spoke to this person. They were so encouraged. They were doing so bad before. Now look at how great they are. But I think that Mm -hmm. everyone, you know, can attest to the fact that you just sometimes need those moments of encouragement 
And those moments don't necessarily get you to your final destination, but they're what you need to get to that next step. You know? mm-hmm. um, and I really find value in that. And I think the year that I, I, you know, the Holy Spirit just brought this out about me. You know, I I tried to find scripture that backed it up. Like, oh my gosh, how am I a woman going to start a nonprofit or a men's group? Um, that that speaks life into men. And, you know, one of the scriptures that I visited was Proverbs 31, which we we all read um, to get, you know, a picture of what it means to be a godly woman or men might read it to figure out who they need to pursue in a wife. But the beginning of the chapter is really about a mom talking to their son about who he should look for in a wife because that person would bring out the best in him. Mm. Wow. Um, You know, the attributes of that woman were what, were what was supposed to like hold up a mirror to who that man was out in the marketplace. Um, And that dynamic, it's like one or two lines in that whole, chapter but it really spoke volumes to me in that there there is a special relationship between men and women that men need to hear from other men but there are also a few women that they'll receive from as well um wow and the magnitude of the that relationship between men and women is so complex and dynamic outside of it being you know something romantic um Hmm. just thinking of you know that proverbs 31 woman and a mother choosing to describe a female to her son to motivate him to become who he was supposed to be you know what i mean like that's pretty wild it's definitely (laughs) countercultural. you know even in the era of feminism and so on and so forth you know your first thought is that well let's figure out what's going on with the men but for me it's like no let's really figure this out because that I feel like and I've experienced as a woman what I'm taught to do trained up and you know told who I am as a woman is totally different from how men are told to hold themselves and regard themselves and think about themselves. And, you know, for some situations, it's appropriate for, you know, depending on who you ask. But in the grand scheme of things, I think that society just does an injustice to men in limiting or stereotyping um, how we encourage them to grow up and how we encourage them to own their manhood you know Hmm. like the at the end of the day we are all human right so if if men aren't aware of their emotions or aren't taught how to balance their expectations or have healthy means of expression then women suffer and that that's the whole point to feminism anyways it's really addressing the fact that men don't really know how to handle women (laughs) you know what I mean (laughs) and in my limited experience (laughs) and maybe for lack of better words this whole idea of like oppressing each you know sex because of a inability to express or to own your own identity is just putting energy into the wrong thing no guys well on the topic of feminism it's like yes women can work it doesn't take away from a man being a man so if a man's identity is caught up in being the provider working the hardest lifting the heaviest weights and then women come alongside and do the same thing then the idea is that it takes away from manhood or manliness. But that's not that none of that defines who you are as a man. You know what I mean? Right. 
It's just what society right. has told you. Right. But that, that's yeah. not true. And I find... No, I was oh, just saying that's not, that's not true. It's so limited, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, um, man, it it's controversial. And I think that's why my mouth's been closed for like the last few years. But what I'm learning about, you know, living for Jesus like every day and like all of the areas of my life and I'm, I'm always getting better, but, um, and I make mistakes and I fall and I'm not perfect and all this stuff, everything, mm-hmm. you know, the eyes, the everything. So, um, <laughs> but like, I love God's grace, but what I'm learning about walking as an authentic Christian man, especially with the communities that he's graced us mm-hmm. with, you know, um, I see being a man and being masculine and encouraging godly masculinity and manhood um, to be really amazing, really fun, really special. And I see the women around me and they feel honored. They feel safe. uh, They feel protected and they feel encouraged Mm -hmm. to be awesome. And I think what I'm thinking is, is that what if like, you know, we were to really live a godly identity um, as, you know, in the way God has created us as men and women. And, and we wouldn't necessarily need these isms because we are honoring each other well, and we're seeing the intrinsic value of each other. And so there wouldn't necessarily be a need for that particular, you know, fight or system or thing or or ideology. You know, and um, and sometimes I think that like holding on to these ideologies actually mitigates against what God would want mm-hmm. to do. You know, if that if that makes sense. Um, and so, so it's like, you know, it's it's kind of crazy because that's very controversial. And, you know, and I come from like a pretty liberal background, but I just see God really changing, changing personally me into being a lot more like not left, not right, not liberal, not conservative, but just like a person. And that person has a little bit of all that stuff sometimes. And, um, and so I, I wanted to say this too, that you, um, you have an anointing that is, now we're starting to go like prophetic, but you have an anointing that is so special and peculiar because you speak to men and obviously men of color are encouraged by your voice, by, by, by what God has put on your life for them. But you have an ability to connect to all men, yeah. regardless of race. And I think that that's really special um, because some people would be like, oh, like, you know, I'm going to go to this person because they're black or like, you know, this and that. But God's heart is not like for right. one kind of thing. God's heart is for everyone and all men deal with masculinity the same. We might have different experiences around that, but we all feel, we all love, we all, you know, are trying to figure out what it means to be a man. And like, and in recent years, it's kind of been like fatal to be a man, honestly, you know, so re reappropriating or re, um, yeah, I think the right word, reappropriating what it means to be a man, a godly man, is like imperative right now for, I think, what God is doing yeah. in, in the world and especially America in this city. And so um, I just appreciate, I appreciate like your heart and like being honest and, and real about it. Like you keep it real mm-hmm. in a really authentic way. It's, and it's, it's, it's helpful. It's helpful to me. Like there's just times where like, you'll just be like, yo, man of God, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, word, <laughs> I shouldn't be doing that. And it will be like, man, <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, wow, she helped me right now because, you know, later on I won't have that problem because right. I deal with it, <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, right. my wife won't have to call me out on it. But no, um, I think I, I but, also um, just wanted to say, yeah. I think the irony in leading a men's group is that I don't have, I don't have any idea what it means to be a man. No idea. Never experienced Mm. it. I've seen other people struggle with it. Like 
I've seen my dad struggle. I've seen my brother struggle. And in my mind, I see the the disconnections. Like I see the hangups and I, I see them, you know, and that's one of the benefits of mm-hmm. being on the outside looking in. It's just like, I see you. I see exactly what you're going through. Um, and, wow. you know, I don't have any of the answers or all the answers, but I have encouragement. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of the, I think yeah. that's what it boils down to is like, because I'm not limited by the things that you guys are as men growing up in our society, I feel like I can speak from a place that is, that is, um, I don't want to say higher than, but unobstructed by your experiences. And it might be like a little prophetic. Hmm. you know like hmm. yeah um, I could see that um so we we have about like 10 or so minutes left um um we got an event coming up on Wednesday I thought it'd be cool if you could talk yeah. about what that's about and I don't know so yeah, on Wednesday the theme for this year with the men of honor foundation is love is greater than fear um So it's just diving into what that means. In this first event, we're going to just talk about what it means to love yourself as a man. We're going to come from Mark 12, 30 to 31. And I'm going to paraphrase because I don't have my Bible here. But um, when Jesus is just saying that, you know, out of all the commandments that have been given to you guys over the years, there's just really three that matter. Or two, I like to say three, like love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul and love your neighbor as yourself. Um, But the love Mm -hmm. your neighbor as yourself piece is really two commandments. You have to first love yourself Mm -hmm. in order to love your neighbor. And I don't think that men are often asked, like, do you love yourself? Do you like yourself? What do you like about yourself? I feel like it's a struggle no matter what your gender is, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, to love yourself well. Yeah. And yeah. And race. Absolutely. And I highly doubt men are asked that question often because it's a feminine, it's associated with femininity. Like, yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's a yes, sensitive question. The ladies question. are going to get around, go around and ask each other and try to love ourselves well. But, you know, the men need to too the in the way that men do it, not the way that the ladies are gonna do it. Um, but it still needs to be done. I mean, I don't think that Jesus' commandments were gender specific. So, <laughs> so mm. you know, I <laughs> wanted to get my guy friends together who I respect and I know have a voice and. They're great thinkers just to talk and to open up the conversation with whoever wants to join. So it should be chill. It should be a safe space. I know that you're going to be bringing a word of encouragement. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It should be interesting. I'm looking yeah, forward to it. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited to, um, man, I was working on that word like all day today and the other day because mm-hmm. I like to think about it and then and then do the research and then sit on it and then do my final draft. So, um, and I'm just really excited because God is on this self-love over fear. Um, Renee, I am so glad you were on the call. Thank you so much. Um, I'm clear on that. I just want to say thank you once again for being on the call. I think I didn't know what, what we would end up talking about. I didn't have a script or anything, but I think like there was a lot of good, there's a lot of juice, a lot of sauce on this. So um, thank you so much for being on the show. And I look forward to men of honor foundation this Wednesday, dropping that word and everybody else. um, Please check us out um, at the men of honor foundation. Um, I'll put a link in the, in the profile. Uh, This is Who Dares Win signing off. Peace.
You're welcome. Hey, thank you so much. It was awesome. <laughs> well, my first interview. Cool. 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 Yeah, yeah. I just, I just wanted to. I'm learning as I go, and like some days I just think all day long because I'm, I'm realizing mm-hmm. I'm like a perfectionist, you know, mm-hmm. which I never thought, you know, and. And I'll just be thinking, and then, and I'm like, yo, like, just get conversations, and we'll just see where it yeah. goes, because that's how we learn anyway. You know, like, I I, I try to space it out by, like, yeah. giving, like, monologues type things, but, um, but there's nothing like this. Like, this is an exchange, and hopefully yeah. there's someone that will relate. 